As a rooted deeply and forward-looking community, we hope that you will be blessed by this message. For more information, visit rechurchza.com. Scriptures with you guys tonight. I think the time we're in is so significant. And as I said to you, these appointed times, <clears throat> these appointed times are appointed by the Lord Himself for nothing other than to create a space to worship Jesus. And tonight we worship the one who went through the heavens, passed through the heavens, and made atonement for us sprinkled the blood on the altar and we remember that tonight and um, we're going to look at the at the implications of the day of atonement Yom Kippur Yom Kippur means day there is a day being appointed a specific day and as I said to you guys in Jewish culture Jewish tradition this day is most probably the most important day on their calendar now um, if you have your Bibles here um, Let's open in, um, in Leviticus chapter 16. Let's read this portion together, chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the, before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Verse 3. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body with water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kinds of goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be, the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a, a censer full of burning coals and fire from the altar before the Lord which with his hands full of sweet incense beaten, beaten fine and bring it, bring it inside the veil and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the, tes on the testimony lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with, the finger, with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. 
There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Verse 20, and when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the, li the live goat, sorry, the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear it on itself, all the iniquities to an un, sorry, uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garment which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garment, come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and the people. 25, the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar and he who released the goat as a scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward he may come into the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought into them to make atonement in the holy place shall be carried outside the camp and they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh and their, and their offal. Then he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward he may come into the camp. This shall be a statute forever for you. Wow. This shall be a statute forever for you. Listen here, we are on the seventh month. I'm gonna read further now, now on the Hebraic calendar. The seventh month, we are on the 10th day now. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you, for on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls it is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and, and consecrated to minister as a priest in the Father's place, in his Father's place, shall make atonement and put on the linen cloths of the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of, of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did it as the Lord commanded Moses. Quite serious, sorry. I know it's a bit of a long portion, but we, we need to take this, um, this, this is, it's important that we understand what happened here so that we can see and, and properly look at the types and the shadows and why it was so important and when we look at the coming of Jesus and we see what Jesus did in the heavens, that the Levitical order has been fulfilled in Christ, and we understand what that what it, which is yet to come, um, it brings it brings life, it brings hope, it brings more than that, it brings it brings an excitement into the hearts of the people of God because that today is a day of repentance. It's a day of repentance. To, to many people, it's a day of repentance. We look at the Jews, and we see so many of the Jews do not, they, they believe in the Messiah, they believe, but, they, but they don't believe that the Messiah has come. For us as the believers of the Lord, today it's a day where we can celebrate 
that our names has been written in the book of life. We can celebrate that we've come to a place where we have repented of our sins. We can celebrate today that Jesus has went into the heavenlies once and for all. And we're going to read scriptures now. But the work that he's done was, was a, a complete work. It was a work once and for all. Do you know that the high priest, the, the high priest does not have to go into the tabernacle every year to make atonement for sins? Jesus did it. He did it once. What is our responsibility now as the people of God? Our responsibility as the people of God is to appropriate and apply that blood. To remember that we've been washed, we've been washed with the blood and not forget it. Our responsibility ultimately today is to repent from dead works. You have repented from your sins. I, I believe everybody in here have repented from their sin. And the day you've repented from your sin was the day that the Lord drew you closer to him. It was a day where you were born again. And you turn around. Repentance in the Hebrew mind means to turn around. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my sinful nature. Francois read it to us in Romans 6. Shall we continue to sin if we have died to sin? Surely not. We've turned away from our sin. We've turned away from our sinful nature. And we've been made alive with Christ. So what is, what is the deal today? It's to come to a place where we can truly become aware. And that's what I'm trusting God tonight for. That God will make us aware of the areas in our lives where we are trying to cover up sins in our lives. Where we are trying to cover up the things where God actually wants to put his hands on. That's dead works. When you've repented from sin... And you've been born into the family of God. You've been born a righteous man, a righteous woman. Tonight is not about your position as a righteous man or a righteous woman. It's got nothing to do with that. The blood of Jesus, the Hebrew writer says, the blood of Jesus cleanses our evil conscience from acts that lead to death. And we should repent from that. We still sit in a body that has a proclivity to sin. Does that make you a sinner? No. It does not affect your position. It does not affect your righteousness. But it affects your fellowship. And as I prayed yesterday and today, I felt how the Lord pressed on my heart. Even this week, it's been, a, it's been a labor to press into the holy place, to press into that place of grace where we can find grace and mercy. So that our conscience will be washed with the blood of Jesus. The only reason we fall back into habitual patterns of sin is because of what we think and what we believe about God and about ourselves. And God wants to cleanse that. The Lord Jesus wants you tonight to take his blood and wash that conscience. Wash it clean tonight. Let's read a couple more scriptures. So if we look at the Old Testament pattern, I just want to go a little bit back there. We see Moses went up to the mountain, he received the tablets, came down, broke it. <laughs> he, went, he went back up a second time We we he, we he engaged with the name of God, the un, unpronounceable name, yod heh vav -Hey. And then we see, uh, we see he went up later again to receive the second tablets. And, and this is a very, it's a very, very um, interesting how, how the, the scholars and how the theologians draws the line. After this, he, he was given the, the second tablets 
and return to the camp on the 10th day of the seventh month. Where are we today? On the 10th day of the seventh month, which was called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Isn't that profound? Leviticus 16, 29, I just want to, want, to, want to recapitulate it. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. And that's where he, that's where he received the law. Let's look at Leviticus 23, verse 23, 24. If you want to read up a little bit more and have a, bit, a better context of the, of the feasts, Leviticus 23 is a great starting place. Leviticus 23, chapter 23, verse 23 and 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month of the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial or a remembrance of blowing the trumpet, a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Verse 26, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall, shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, and you shall do no work on, on that day. So, I just want to. I just want to clear something here, um, and we're going to look at it. But there's a lot of Jews fasting out of works, and it's a dead work. So, I really believe that if we understand why we fast on this day, it's going to help us to engage in worship, and not in a dead work. A dead work stands in direct opposition to our worship. And what the Lord is inviting us to is to a place of worship. So if we look at Isaiah 58, Isaiah 58, he talks about this fast. He talks about this affliction of the soul. And he speaks about how, how it will look like when we please the Lord. How it will look like when, if we fast to worship and not fast because we just, we, we, it's just part of a ritual. It's just part of what we do. Let's just quickly read Isaiah 58 together. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Can you see where we are? This whole 10 days, this whole season we're in is a season of blowing the trumpet Turn back, my, my people, from what? Turn back from covering up your sins. Stop it. Turn away from covering up the things. If you have nothing to prove, you've got nothing to lose, and then you will also have nothing to hide. If you have to prove something the whole time, guess what? You have lots to lose. If you have to prove your name, you're gonna, you're gonna, have, to, you're gonna have to protect your name. But if the Lord... If you've lost your name because you carry the name of Jesus, you've got nothing to lose because you carry his name. If you, have, if you have a lot to prove, you have a lot to lose. And if you have a lot to lose, you have a lot to hide. And that's what this day is about. This is what our repentance is about. Repentance is about losing the things that doesn't matter to the Lord. I believe the Lord wants people to lose their dignity tonight. So start, dag broer. You know, I believe the Lord wants to undignify us tonight. Why? So that he can establish his glory on us. Revelation says he writes his name. The remnant will be people that are recognized by his name all written all over them, all over them, all over them. He writes his name over us. If my name is written all over me, there's no place for his name. And that's what repentance is all about. I have nothing to prove, therefore I have nothing to lose. And therefore I have nothing to hide. Guys, let's settle this tonight. Even in the garden, as, as we sat this week, in, and 
we had foundations this week, powerful week. The Lord revealed something to me um, that happened in the garden. Can you remember when Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate from the tree? They hid away. Did God call them out and said, why did you sin? Adam, why did you sin? Was that God's words to Adam? God said to him, where are you? Even there, after he sinned, there was no condemnation. God wanted to walk with him. He was there in the afternoon to walk with him in the breeze. So God came to walk with him. And they said, we hid away from you because we're ashamed. And why were they ashamed? Because they had to cover up something. God did not condemn them. Friends, hear me out tonight. Any place in our lives where we have to cover up things, we have to cover up things, we have to repent from that. Any place in our lives where we, where we, where we cannot say that the cross was enough, where I have to control things, where I have to work things in my power because the cross was not enough. It's dead works. I'm engaging in a place where I want to prove myself. It's a dead work. The Bible says we need to repent from dead works. You have repented from your sin. You're no longer a sinner. Stop covering up your sin. Stop covering up the stuff that God wants to heal in your life. All the frustrations, the irritations, the areas in my life where I where I so want to take charge. But God says, whoa, it's not yours. Can I go ahead of you, please? Can you stop now? And you're just like, I just have to do it because if I don't move, somebody's got to move. Cry aloud, listen to the trumpet. That's what the trumpet says. That's why we're blowing the trumpet. That's why I'm blowing the trumpet tonight to encourage you tonight to repent and turn away from the areas in your life where you want to try and cover up things. And confess your sins to the Lord. If we've repented of our sin, we don't have to repent of our sins again, our sin again. Because Jesus took all our sin. If you look at the scapegoat, the scapegoat was symbolizes Jesus, not just taking our sins, but Jesus becoming our sin and it's been dealt with forever. That scapegoat sinned away. He's dealt with your sins. Don't you bring it up back again. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression. Now there's a difference between iniquities and transgression. And I just quickly want to mention it. Iniquities... Iniquities, the word iniquities means an inner bent in my character. An iniquity is something that is, 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 is bent inside of my character. A transgression, iniquity, also inside, people normally can't see an iniquity. A transgression is something that's not hidden. A transgression is, a, is, is something that's visible to people. This guy stole, this guy lies, this guy is, is wrathful, he's... We can see a transgression. Now the Lord dealt with both. When the cross was planted into the earth, into the skull, our iniquities inside was dealt with and our transgressions was dealt with. The visible things that people can see. Tell my people their transgression and tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Listen what they ask. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls? Listen to this. What is the day of atonement about? Afflicting your soul. We're going to talk a little bit about that just now. Why have we afflicted our souls and you 
take no notice. Guys, this is critical. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, your fa you fast for strife and debate and to strife with the first with the fist of the wickedness, you will not fast as you do this day. To make your voice heard on high. It is a fast that I have chosen. Do you hear that? It is a fast that the Lord has chosen. A day for a man to afflict his soul. It is to bow down his head like a bulrush. And to spread out sackcloth and ashes. Would you call this a fast? And an acceptable day to the Lord? Is it not the fast that I have chosen to lose? Listen here. Here he's giving it. To lose the bond of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring your house, that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rare God. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Can you see what's happening here? Can you see how the affliction looks like? It's not just a work. It's not just, oh, I'm fasting now and I'm. Yes, a fast afflicts your body. But do we have mercy? Do we have compassion? Do we, do we break our own flesh? Do we slander our own brothers and sisters for our own name and for our own purpose and for our own status? Do we stand on the corner streets and, and make it known to the whole world that we are so holy? Or are we cooperating with the Spirit, the life-giving Spirit of God? Because that, it seems to me that this is what this fast is all about. Let me just give you some, just a quick summary of this day. We are not to work on Yom Kippur because it's a day of atonement. If we don't rest, we are to be destroyed. This is the law. It is, a, it is a, a permanent regulation. It is to be obeyed no matter where we live. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest. We are to afflict ourselves. It is to be a complete, it is to be complete day from sunset to sunset. Denying ourselves means more than just not eating and fasting. And that's why I read to you Isaiah chapter, chapter 58. Romans 8, Paul writes here, he says, For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death of the deeds of the body, you will live. I think it's important for us to understand what the Lord is calling us for and what the Lord is calling us to. It's very easy to fall back into a law. And if we read Romans 7, we see that the law of God is good and perfect and that it was given so that we will sin, that we will fall into the trap. Why? So that we will understand that we, the, the only way to step out of it is that we, we must understand we need Jesus. 
And therefore, we live by the law of the Spirit of, of, of life. There's a law of, of the Spirit that's been given to each believer. And now, we do not live according to regulations anymore, but we live according to the law that's been written in our hearts and in our minds. Does it mean we should ignore this day? Does it mean we should ignore the feasts? No, I think there's this, there's this, this thinking that ugh, this, is, this is just an Old Testament concept. I want to say again, we, this is one book. It's one book. We have to look at this whole book in context. It's not the Old or the New Testament. If the Lord said this is a day to be celebrated forever, then it, then it is to be celebrated forever. But the way we engage with it is now very important. And we, we, we cannot allow ourselves to think that when we engage with it, it makes us more holy or it makes us more perfect. You are, you, you've, you've been made perfect. You, you are a righteous man and righteous woman. So our, the deal tonight, yeah, and I'm gonna end off here. I wanna read one more scripture to you. is that we will understand that God wants to deal with our evil conscience and that there are things that he wants to take care of and he wants to settle it in our lives. Why? So that fellowship can be restored with his spirit. That's it. Here, let me give you an example. If I, have had, if, if I had a tiff with, my, with Vanessa, Vanessa is the woman I'm married to, for those of you who don't, do not know, and we've had a bit of a, yeah, a roll this morning. And tonight I want a bit of intimacy. She's going to say to me, hey, what about this morning? And I'm going to say, ah, oh, oh, just let's forget about it. Forgive me for everything, man. Is that how it works? No. And that, but that's what we do with the Holy Spirit. So now I have to go back and say, hey, I'm sorry that I violated you this morning. I'm sorry that I did this to you. I, and, and the specific thing that I've done, I'm going to say sorry about that. I don't have to, to, to turn my whole life around and remarry her. I've married her. That's what happened when I've repented. I've come into the body of Christ. I've, we are His. We belong to Him. What's important is, is that I confess the specific thing that I've done and not try and cover it up or justify it. And the reason for that is, is so that the intimacy between me and Vanessa will be restored. That's what this day is all about. That intimacy with the Holy Spirit will be restored. That's what our repentance and our confession is all about now. We confess our are specific deeds that we've done towards one another or towards God so that we can be forgiven and healed. And we walk away. We stop covering up the things that we shouldn't be covering up and, and try and justify ourselves. Yes, no, I, I, you know how it works in relationship. No, 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 I, I'm sorry, but you were also late. No, no, no. Sorry that I did that to you. Please forgive me. Stop covering up. Stop explaining. Stop justifying. Atonement in English actually means at one mint. At one mint. Atonement at one mint. It speaks about the unity. Atonement. Jesus made atonement for us so that we will become one with him, with the Father. Forever. A oneness. And that could only take place in fellowship. That's why it's a day of repentance. So that the oneness, at oneness, the oneness will be restored with him. Isn't that profound? Second Corinthians 5.21 reads, 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Father made Jesus who knew no sin to become, become sin for us, so that you and I and those behind us that are still yet to come into the fold, all the nations and the Jews, that they will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm reading the last scripture to you, Hebrews 9. Let's read together Hebrews 9, verse 23 to 28. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into, into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had, then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I just want to say this, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages. Yom Kippur speaks, the Day of Atonement speaks of the end of all things. The end. Where sins and, 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 and transgressions is put away. And just as it is appointed for, for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, not to deal with what? Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Friends, I want to bless you. I can go on. I have so much to share about this. I think I said what the Lord wanted me to say tonight. It's a holy time. Let's not forget that this is, a, this is a time dedicated by the Lord himself for us. Where we, can, where we can become aware again of the fact that it's only his blood and by his blood that our evil conscience are cleansed. Thank you for taking the time to listen and we hope you've been blessed. For more information, visit readchurchza.com.